Oh, Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of every present heart be acceptable to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There we go. All right. Well, modern advertisers have discovered the art of making people want stuff, right? I mean, if you think about advertising, really it's, it's to get someone that doesn't know anything about your product and not only to, to, to drive people to want it, but to literally spend money uh, oftentimes to buy it, right? Uh, oftentimes a 30-second commercial on television, if it's done well, can sometimes create uh, a buzz, right? It gives us the ability to, to maybe talk about the commercial. I mean, oftentimes people that could care less about the Super Bowl, what are, what's the one thing that some people really enjoy? It's the ads, right? It's the commercials on television. I mean, they're cute, they're funny, sometimes they go viral, and, and, and they're, just, they're just fun and unique to watch. But the reason why those are there, and the reason why people spend literally millions of dollars on, on advertising is to get you to do things that you don't really want to do or to buy something that you would never really consider. And unfortunately, we have kind of become conditioned in this way in our society, right? Uh, generally speaking, we, we buy something or we go somewhere or we do something because we've been conditioned. Uh, maybe uh, we are aware of it, maybe we're not aware of it, right? But we're all driven to do things from pressure. Now, we're drawn towards the flashy, the, the fun, the, the funny, the, the expensive, the, the extremes. How many of us are driven towards the boring? How many of us love boring stuff? Oh, yeah, there's nothing better than sitting down when you're kind of tired and you have a long, thick, boring book. Oh, isn't that the... No, no one in their right mind does that, right? It's ridiculous to think about. And, and, and sometimes, if we're honest, we look at some of the books in the Old Testament and we're like, this one is a serious snooze fest, right? This one is, is, is rough. And if you were look at, at all of the Old Testament books and, and, and you didn't really know what you were getting into by reading according to their names and you just came across a book named Judges. Now, what would you think if you came across a book named Judges, right? Hmm. Well, uh, I don't want to read about courtroom drama, right? I, I don't really care about legalities that perhaps God gave to some Old Testament Jewish people about things they're supposed to do or, or, or not do, right? right? The, the literal name judges doesn't connote anything exciting. And, and if you were to base whether or not you read this book or, or stories from within this book based solely upon the name, you'd be like that guy up there, uh, no, no, no thank you, Pastor. I, I'll read one of the Gospels again. Or I'll read one of those other books that you got me to read because I didn't think they'd be interesting. But they really were, right? But Judges, that's, that's a bridge too far, right? And while it is true that, that all parts of the Bible are important, uh, and, and even the parts of the Bible that have rules and regulations that we're supposed to follow, those are important. I'm here to tell you that the book of Judges is not that. The book of Judges is not a book of, of just kind of boring courtroom drama, uh, of rules and regulations that we're supposed to follow, right? The, the Hebrew word translated into our English that we oftentimes read as simply judges, it, it carries a very narrow view. And in our culture where we live, when we think of judges, we think of, of a man or a woman and, and oftentimes a black or a white robe that maybe has a a gavel, you know, that wooden hammer that, that bangs it down and, and has to listen to one boring case after another, right? But the Hebrew word that we have translated as judges can really be translated in, in a much more broad sense. A, a very good translation of this word could literally be heroes. That's kind of interesting. Hey, I, I'll read that Old Testament book called Heroes, but I don't want to read about judges, right? Here's another one It could be very good translation, would be leader or, or, or chieftains or deliverers. 
And there's, there's another two-word definition that I found that, that could be a very good Hebrew translation that, at least from my background and the things that excite me, I'm like, yeah, I'll read this one. How about this? Warrior rulers. That's literally a good translation of the Hebrew word that we have for judges. Warrior rulers. Yeah, I'll read a book about warrior rulers. That sounds really interesting. And while those alternative titles are, are extremely different than, than what we have, which is just simply judges, what we have to understand is that the book of Judges is a book full of stories of, of leaders who did sometimes judge and make rulings and, and tell the people what to do. But oftentimes, almost every time, every one of those rulers or judges or warrior rulers, right, would have to go to battle. And, and, and oftentimes they had extreme events that were going on around them. And, and sometimes God literally gave these, these warrior rulers supernatural powers and abilities to get stuff done. A short one-sentence summary of the book of Judges is that it's this. It's a book, a true book of stories of men and women who fought hard for their people to lead them in victory over their oppressors. Have you ever seen any of those stories on television about Medal of Honor winners? Oh, they're fascinating, right? These, these are, are men and sometimes women who, who have been in battle, who have oftentimes died for their, their fellow men and women around them, right? Uh, to, against great odds. And their stories are so fascinating. Now, the book of Judges is just that, right? It's like the Medal of Honor winners uh, of God's chosen people uh, of how these men and women led God's nation against great odds. And the time span that this covers is about 300 years. You think, well, that's not that long. Well, how long has our country been officially around, right? Now, we were around you know, back before the French and Indian War. But when did we officially become a nation? Let's, let's see how our, our schools have, have, have worked. What's the year? Oh, I heard a lot of older, older voices, right? But yes, 1776. So that means that our country is officially younger than the entire span that the book of Judges is talking about, right? So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting when you think about it. And unfortunately, the nation of Israel, during this time of the book of Judges, uh, did a lot of really bad and dumb stuff. They were evil, and they were wicked. And they would turn their backs on God, and they say, No, I don't think so, God. And God said, Okay, I'll let you do your own thing. I'll just sit back here and wait. And as the, the nation of Israel did their own thing, they got into a lot of problems. For Surprise, surprise. And then after a while, they started thinking, oh man, life was better when we followed after the one true God, Yahweh. What should we do? I don't know. Keep trying our way? Yeah, let's try that some more. And they get further into problems. And eventually, they, they were so beaten down, there was no other way to turn but to look up and say, God, oh, I'm sorry. What have we done? What have we gotten ourselves into? My microphone just died. I think it did. All right, well, we're using this mic then. So God would restore the nation of Israel, right? And, and then, unfortunately, the cycle just repeated time and time again, right? Well, as I read through this book, there's a few truths that stood out to me that, that I think are important that, that we understand, right? The first one is this. Uh, there's this training for godliness that, that has to happen. And, uh, you know, Christina, I, maybe it's, it's providence that you came when, when, when you did, right? It is so critical that we invest in the lives of our children and our children's children. It's not good enough for us to have one generation of good and strong and godly people and leaders, right? That's good, 
But if we're not passing that knowledge on, if we're not equipping the people that are coming behind us, we're in trouble, right? The need for strong families, the need for strong Christian education is more important now than ever. And the enemy knows that, and that's why he's targeting families. And that's why he's targeting the education of our youth. It was true then, and it's equally true now. Another important truth that we see from the book of Judges is the danger of the so what? The danger of apathy. You know, that's kind of a big word. We maybe don't use apathy too much, but that's a good one. The so what? Ah, yeah, I know I shouldn't do that. Yeah, I know I, I shouldn't cheat. Yeah, I know I, I shouldn't watch this or go there, or take this, but, eh, so what? A little sin doesn't hurt anyone, does it? You don't hear anyone picking up a bottle of arsenic and saying, ah, a little bit of arsenic won't hurt, right? We, we, we don't say that, but we oftentimes say that, or at least live like that, when it comes to sin. Israel, again, was... Very similar to America. Both nations could, could easily make the, the stand that look how blessed that we are. Look at how strong and, and healthy and blessed that we are. And yet despite the blessings, the goodness that God has bestowed upon us, so often we get soft and complacent and apathetic towards sin. The so what? And turn from God. Too often people think that, why does it really matter? I mean, yeah, I know I should probably follow God with my whole heart, but hey, I go to church most Sundays. Man, I throw a 20 in the offering plate, or man, I'm really good. I put a couple hundred bucks in the offering plate. Look at me. I'm really good, right? Yet history shows us that when we grow cold and apathetic and start thinking, so what? We go very quickly from being a blessed nation to being a cursed nation. Another important truth from this fascinating book is that Judges is about real people. I still remember um, before I went to seminary, there is this man I really respected. His name was Frank. And he was a strong Christian. And even though he was uh, my friend's parent, he said, just call me Frank. It was kind of weird calling an adult by their first name, but he wanted me to do that. And I said, Frank, I, I, I got a question. He's like, yeah, what's that? And I said, you know, when I read in the Bible, I read these stories about characters and people that do these amazing things. Why don't we see that today? What, why is there this disconnect between the people in the Bible and the people today? And, and I remember hearing his answer and thinking it was a lame answer. Or maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, right? I know I wasn't real impressed. But something that I've come to understand is that the book of Judges is a book of real people with real character flaws. I don't read the book of Judges and say, oh, they've got it all figured out. Man, they don't sin, they don't have any problems. The book of Judges is highly flawed people that God raises up to do amazing things and does it despite their flaws. And sometimes because of their flaws, they continue to get into trouble later on. I mean, we've all heard of Samson, right? Samson and Delilah, right? Perhaps the strongest man in all of human history. But he had a fatal flaw, didn't he? He sure did. The book of Judges is all about real people. And if you've ever been like me and have, have been reading the Bible and you think, man, I could never measure up, <laughs> pick up the book of Judges and start reading. Start reading about these people that had some serious problems. And many of them, perhaps most of them, never really shook them all off. Well, today, besides giving the, this general overview of the book, what I want to do is is to spend a little bit of time in looking at that very lengthy text that my wife read so so well. Maybe not as willingly as she would have liked. She's like, man, Rich, you had to give me that really long one, didn't you? <laughs> With all the names. Right? 
But it's, it's honestly one of my favorite messages in the book of Judges because it portrays a woman of valor, of courage. Ladies, if, if you want to emulate a woman, here is someone to follow after. Her name was Deborah, right? She was strong. She was bold. She was called to be a, a judge, a leader, a prophetess, right? This, this was a strong woman. And, and along with this strong woman was a guy that I'm just going to say had some issues, right? And, and that, that guy was, was the commanding general of the military of Israel. His name was Barak, right? And when I think of commanding generals, I think of men that are tough. You know, they can literally just put a handful of nails in their mouth, chew them up and spit them out and just grr, kind of grr at you. And I think of, of some of the best commanding generals in American history, and in my opinion at least, uh, General George Patton was one of them. His troops hated him, but he could push his military to do things to accomplish amazing tasks that most people never thought possible, right? He was oftentimes accused of being brash and harsh and even heartless with his troops, but he got the job done. And Barak... Well, you would think, well, he was the commanding general of Israel's army, right? This is back in the olden days when it was hand-to-hand -hand combat. You didn't shoot people from afar, generally speaking. You got up close, and it was tough. Both Patton and Barak were commanding generals, but that's about all of the similarities that they had together. You see, Barak is what I lovingly refer to as a girly man. Right? I'm sure that's not politically correct. I don't care. Barak was cowering in fear when he was told by Deborah what to do. Deborah said, Barak, good news. God is on our side, and you are going to go out and conquer this horrible enemy. Yes. And you're going to go out and do it, so go do it. No. What do you mean, no? Well, I'm kind of afraid. Oh, don't, don't fear. God is on our side. He will lead you to victory. Yeah, I know you say that, Deborah, but I don't want to do it by myself. Will you go with me? If you go with me, Deborah, then I'll follow. Then I'll believe. Then I'll lead our military. But I'm too afraid otherwise. So he clung to his fear instead of his faith. Barak was gripped with the fear that he saw in his, with his own two eyes. It didn't make sense. There's no reason why he should have been able to be victorious. And even though that this godly woman, Deborah, said, go and have peace and knowledge knowing that God is going to give you victory. No, I, I don't want to do that. I won't trust unless you come with me. You know, the setting of this story is, is a common one, unfortunately. After a previous hero, a warrior leader of Israel had died, the people of Israel, what do they do? They turn back to their evil ways. They forgot God. Oh, look at our prosperity. Look at how good we are. Look at how blessed our nation has become. And they forsook God. And the people of, of Cana began to oppress the Israelites because God removed his hand of protection on the people. And the people, eventually, they cried out to the Lord, Lord, forgive us. We have sinned greatly. So God rose up this godly woman, Deborah, to lead them and to encourage them with the word of God. And after a period of time, she said to Barak, go out and you will be victorious. Take 10,000 men. Doesn't seem like enough, but don't worry. God's on our side, and he will fight with you. And the commanding general of Israel said this. If you'll go with me, I'll go. But if you'll not go with me, I will not go. He was scared. He was given the, the assurance by God through this prophetess that he would have an assured victory, right? 
It doesn't matter what the odds are, Barak. Just go out and trust in the Lord and you will win. The people were crying out. This was Barak's opportunity to be kind of lifted up like, you know, those old movies of football greats. You know, like Rudy was one of my favorites, right? This little kid that wanted to play for Notre Dame football so badly. And he was just, he was just short and he was little and he was small, but man, he had heart. And he only got to play like one snap of the final game. And then after he played, the whole team picked him up on their shoulders and they carried him out of the field. I mean, that could have been Barak, right? He was fearful and he, he, he didn't really completely trust. But here was his opportunity to be lifted up. Oh, look at you, Barak. You have accomplished this. But he didn't trust. So what do we learn about Barak, about Deborah, about the nation of Israel? I mean, this is, this is a, a story, yes, it's a true story. It's about a man who did lead the nation of Israel to victory because Deborah went and held his hand basically and, okay, fine, I'll come with you. But a woman will have the final victory. And that's the whole tense spike through the skull into the ground thing for those of you guys that are a little bit queasy the bible yeah it gets into some of that so what are the lessons for us right because this is a historical narrative it's it's the telling of a true event in in a narrative form i mean it's just interesting yes but but what can we learn from it and i think this is a very important lesson that we have to understand which is that prosperity strength they're good but they oftentimes breed something something oftentimes comes from them right prosperity and strength oftentimes breeds pride and arrogance and complacency with sin the enemy is so good at getting us to to shift our attention from that which is urgent and important that God is calling us to do, to go to battle, to fight against, to getting us distracted to our ease, our comfort, and the pursuit of wealth and power. Well, when the bills are paid, then I'll give. When the family is comfortable and and healthy, and everything seems to be going our way, okay, God, then I'll take that step of faith. But not until then. Oftentimes, we have to wait until we are at our wit's end, where we have no place to go. I can't go left, I can't go right, forward or backward. There's no place to go. I'm surrounded by my enemies. And then, oftentimes, we look up and cry out and say, God, save me. You know, growing up, I would hear some different sayings from my dad. And one of those sayings was, Rich, you can learn things the hard way or the what? That's just some of you have heard my dad's sayings too, right? I don't think it was just my dad's sayings. I think other people have heard that as well. Well, God says to us today, Bethany Lutheran, friends of Bethany, those of you that are here hearing this message you have a choice you can do things the easy way or you can do things the hard way you can go where I tell you to go and do what I want you to do or you can wait until your life is stripped bare and you're crying out in anguish after you've wasted away the best of what God has given you and then you cry out We can follow after God with our whole heart, with our mind, and with our spirit now. Or we can wait until we're broken. Until we hear that that, that horrible news from our doctor that we have cancer. Until we're told that that our child is dying and there's nothing that we can do. Until we lose it all in the stock market. And all of that that wealth that we're trying to amass to have that nest egg to to retire comfortably. And there's, there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. There's nothing wrong with having a comfortable retirement. But we got to ask ourselves, what is our focus? All God wants is our hearts and to follow after him. 
Well, there's another important lesson that we need to take from this, and that's simply this, to be a people of faith. Barak was told that he would win the battle, but he didn't believe. What did he lack? Faith. He doubted. He had to have a physical assurance that God would go with him. And that was why he demanded Deborah to go. Today, we don't need a prophet or a prophetess. We have God's word, the Bible. As we read the promises of the scriptures, we have a choice to make. We can choose to believe them or not to believe them. The Bible says to be anxious about nothing, but I'm telling you what, when I'm sitting in the dentist chair, I get anxious. When, when my kid is in a position that's over their head and I can't help them anymore because I'm halfway across the country, I sometimes get anxious. I don't know if any of you have struggled with that, but do you realize when we get anxious about those things, what we're really doubting? We're doubting God and we're lacking faith. The greatest and most important truth of the Bible is that even though we are sinners, Christ died for us. That he chose us. We didn't choose him. God reached out and said, I want to save you. I want to deliver you. I want to wash you of your sins. Thank you. And then he died on the cross so that we could not have to pay for those sins. So that we could be made perfect and righteous and holy in his sight. So that we can move from being a child of the devil, which is what the Bible says all humans are born as. We're not born as God's children. We're born as children of the devil. Do we realize that? And when God changes our hearts, we move from being a child of the devil to a child of God's. And the key to unlocking that is that word faith. Others doubt, but we are called to have faith. Some people doubt God's mercy. He he won't really have mercy on me. I I just don't deserve it. Sometimes they doubt their, their, their abilities or God's abilities. All we're called to do is simply throw our hands up and surrender and say, God, I I don't have anything to offer you. There's really not much here left. I've squandered it all, but Lord, if you want me, here I am. And when you read the stories and judges, there's stories of people that oftentimes had a whole lot less than nothing. And God says, I'm going to choose you to do amazing things. Jesus is what makes this possible. Through faith in Jesus, we are washed of our sins. Through what Jesus did, God now looks at us and is pleased with us when we come to him through faith in Christ. What we all must do is to have full and complete trust in Jesus. You don't have to start a Christian school. You don't have to raise an amazing family, Kitty. I love seeing your family here, right? It's awesome. And you worked hard. But you don't have to do that. You don't have to have your life in order. There's nothing that God has in a little contract saying you've got to do this, this, and this before you come to me. God says, come as you are. Dirty, sinful, fallen, someone that struggles with anxiety, that really doesn't have very good faith, and say, Lord, I am yours if you want me. And God says, I do. And he wraps his loving arms around you and says, I love you. But God, I struggle. I know you do. But God, I don't have much faith. God says, you just need the faith of a mustard seed to move mountains. God, I've got less than that. We'll work with it, right? So in summary, the book of Judges, it's not a snooze fest. It's about real people that have struggles and failures. And oftentimes when they did amazing things, the very next thing they did was a boneheaded thing. But God in his patience and his mercy and his love 
took care of them anyways. And it's good to know that we have a warrior leader named Jesus who went to battle for us. And that all is required of us is to surrender, to hold up our hands, and say, I believe. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the true stories of these men and women who did these amazing things. And Father, we just ask that you would help us to truly have the faith that we need, Lord, to just surrender, to give up, to stop trying to do things on our own. And Lord, as we take that step of faith and come to you, Lord, we're going to want to take back the reins periodically. We're going to want to take over our lives and take back control and do things our way again. Lord, when that happens, gently and lovingly take back the reins from us. Lord, may we not have to go through the same trials and struggles that we read in the book of Judges so that we can surrender having faith in you. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.